The Messianic era, according to Jewish tradition, is a time when everyone in the world is perfected without faults, flaws, and even sin. Everyone in humanity speaking in the Hebrew language and the world acknowledging that the Jews have been right about God all along. And King Moshe draws his kingdom according to Rambam and his commentary on the scripture of the Hebrew Bible. None of which can occur. This Messianic era said to come. None of it can occur in the real world. It would take the power of God to completely change the natural order of the world and the natural order of humanity itself. <clears throat> with miracles and wonders, which is not supposed to happen in the Messianic era, according to Rambam, the great scholar of the Hebrew Bible and the Talmud of antiquity. Antiquity is from the beginning to 400 common era, and from 400 common era to 1600 is the Middle Ages, also known as the Dark Ages. And from 1600 to today, it's called the Common Era, and many ages occurred within that time. It begins with the Age of Enlightenment, reason, followed through with knowledge, uh, science, medicine, and today, information, which uh, began with the uh, advent of the computer in the late 1960s. And, of course, we have the Internet. And the dawning of the Internet was 1957, when the Russians sent up the first satellite called Sputnik. That was in 1957, the year I was born, as a matter of fact. But that was the dawning of the age of uh, satellites in space and then, of course, the Internet. God has never changed the beliefs and thoughts of any human being, Jews or Gentiles. And yet, in the time when of the Messianic era, everyone is supposed to exalt the Jewish people, speak Hebrew. Now that would be quite a feat for any man to even attempt. <clears throat> and God's never done that in the Hebrew Bible. He uses men to achieve his purpose. Men like Noah, build me an ark. I have a purpose, I need an ark. King David, King Solomon, build me a temple. The exiles of Assyria, Babylon, who returned by a declaration of Cyrus of Persia, who were forgiven of all sins. God says it was for, it's just for me. You've, you've continued to sin. You haven't offered sacrifices to me. But you know what he's really saying there? Contrary to what the Christians say, he's saying no matter what you do, you're mine. And I forgive all of your sins in your exile and remember them no more. And they're released to build Cyrus's declaration. He was appointed this Gentile, Cyrus of Persia who defeated Babylon and the Chaldeans who had defeated the Assyrians. Now they had taken it and defeated the northern kingdom. Babylon took Judah, the southern kingdom. They were all in Assyria. All thir Remnants of all 13 tribes returned according to the scripture. I do know that the Talmud has some 10 tribes lost. That just simply does not uh, uh, that's not what the scripture says. So, I don't know where the story comes from. I'm not a family scholar. I, I'm a scholar of the prophets. And that's what this is about. It's not about the Torah, the first five books. It's about the prophets and the end times. Is there a messianic age? 
Or is there a day of the Lord? Because the Messianic age does not include it. So, the Messianic era is based on verses in the Hebrew Bible that you can actually, if you take them to be prophecy, and they appear to be, then you come up with the Messianic age. But again, it can't happen. And that's not how God works. And he has a day of the Lord. A better interpretation is needed of the prophecies of the Messianic era with God's multiple purposes for having a verse written that appears to be prophecy but cannot occur without his changing the natural order of the world. What we do have as prophecy that can occur are the times to come of Jeremiah 31, verses 27 through 31 and 38. It's chapter 31. There's, there's three different. They, they, they all begin with those verses, but they're very large paragraphs with many of the verses. The time to come is here. The land blooms again. Jerusalem has been rebuilt. And the new covenant between God and the Jewish people is here. Those verses, that's what they say. Verse 28 is basically, the Jews have returned. The land blooms again. God is watchful over them plants. And their cattle are, are, are well fed and fat. And that is today, and it began in 1948. After the land had laid desolate for well over 2,000 years, after the Holocaust, the Jews returned. And quite simply, what God has said is it's not that everybody's got to be sin free for me to come back. Or the next mitzvah performed will bring God back. No, it's just come back. Because when he comes, he comes with a new covenant, a covenant of once again, I forgive your sins and remember them no more, just as he did with the Syria of Babylon, exiles, and they return to the second temple. And what do we all know? There's another temple to be built. The time is here, though. That, that, I, I consider that the verse, Jeremiah 31, 28, the land blooms again. The next verse that applies, see a time is coming, Jerusalem shall be rebuilt, as it is today. See a time is coming, I will make a new covenant with you, not like the covenant I made with your fathers out of Egypt, which is acknowledged in the Christian Bible. And the covenant it reads, I make a new covenant with you. I shall write Torah on your hearts, and everyone shall heed me. But that's not that's not how to read it. Because he says, he says, because this is going to happen, Torah on your heart, which is a metaphor, of course. For I will forgive your sins and remember them no more. And we have a temple to be built. Surprise, surprise. You think he didn't know? Of course he knew. He knows all things from beginning to end. So it's a covenant of sin forgiveness. You come back. I'm going to come back. I'm going to. I'm not going to remember any of the sins you have done since you've been gone. And he says in a covenant of friendship that comes with Moshiach, which means the Anointed One, the descendant of David of Isaiah 11, 1 and two, who the sages believe is described in Isaiah 53, known as the Leper Scholar. He's got a temple to be rebuilt, and he provides for it in Malachi 3. That's where you go from there. See the time is coming. Well, it's here. 
Isaiah wrote for the Assyrian Babylon exile. Jeremiah was writing for the Roman dispersal, the diaspora. And that means away from, from Israel, away from the promised land. And that's where the Jews were for the most part uh, until they returned in 48 and created Israel within the promised land. It doesn't, it's not all the promised land, but it, it, it's a, a incredible country. Incredible country. It's new. I mean, they have the whole city, of course, but it's uh, vibrant. They're, they're always in the top ten, just about everything you look for in the country. The question becomes, how did the, now that the time is here, the new covenant is here, how do the Jewish people, how are they informed of it? How do they find out? God has to use a man. Now, Moses relayed the first covenant to the Israelites, the Jewish people. And he says a prophet like Moses will come one day, come again. He says this in Deuteronomy. And he's never come. Moses is known for two things. The Exodus, leading the, Israel, the, the slave Israelites out of Egypt into the Promised Land. And Orthodox Judaism believes, and I agree 100%, that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. That God dictated it to him verbatim. Which makes sense. How else is Moses going to know the story of Genesis? How, long before his time. How is he going to know the laws of Leviticus, the animal sacrificial worship and atonement laws? And in general, how the Jewish people had derived from the Torah 613 laws. Now, a lot of them had to do with the sacrificial system, which God did away with. He just said, I, I know, I taught you what sin is. I taught you if you sin, it's going to cost you. I made you give up your animals. And I taught you how to cook your food. Cook your food. You know, that was still being disobeyed in the times of Solomon. He found some of his own soldiers out in the field after a battle, chopping up bulls and eating them all. And he, you know, in a fit, he ran out there and told him, I'm building a big altar at my camp tonight. Bring your bulls up there. So anyway, that whole system was done away with. There's only, okay, so we have Elijah's coming. We have the prophet like Moses' coming. We have the Moshe, descendant of David, coming. And we have one description of a righteous servant. And each of these men were righteous, and they were all servants of God. No man has ever come who fits all 12 verses of Isaiah 53. The one description we have. Not even Jesus Christ. He's not even close. He's not in a discussion, in my opinion. And I'm going to show that partly in this video. But there will be many videos to follow. This site, this channel, is primarily for me to promote two books that I have written. One of them is called Isaiah 53 and the Day of the Lord, which has a lot of this information, but oh so much more. And the sequel to it, the second book, The Life of God's Righteous Servant. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, put the plug in for it, instead of at the end, I'm almost done. You can find these two books, they're unpublished. I'm having a difficult time getting them published because it just turns Judaism's Messianic era upside down. And um, these publishers, the Jewish publishers, primarily love to sell the Talmud and the Hebrew Scriptures, Shemash. Um, they don't want they don't want to offend the rabbis. And here's something you never hear. Here's something they never teach when they're yelling and praying for Moshe to come and make all these changes in the world. Have the Jews exalted by the world and everybody saying, "Jews, you were right," and the world's at peace and in harmony. Nations, nations, friends with nations. 
Here's what here's what those first those twelve verses boil down to. Here's who we're looking for. The man is despised. And and remember, the Christians say this is Jesus. The man is despised, shunned by men, a man of suffering, familiar with disease, <clears throat> and he's accounted, thought of, as plagued, smitten, as in a hard blow, <clears throat> and afflicted by God. He is a man with persistent hardships and troubles, grievously affected, especially by disease, and severely injured at one time or another. A man of many bruises and scars, some books say stripes, the Christians are famous for saying, by his stripes we are healed, and they're referring to the whips uh, used in the scourge by Rome at, in the Passion of the Christ leading to the crucifixion. The man is a sinner. And though, as though God does not like him, he is disfigured at birth. This is not the perfect, unblemished Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. There's no crucifixion in Isaiah 53. There's no death. The man is exposed to death. Jesus wasn't exposed. He died. The man is given long life. Sees his children. Jesus didn't have children. And he makes the many righteous by his knowledge, by his knowledge. It's not by human sacrifice, it's not by blood. This is what God says with regards to the rabbis, who would be called shepherds in the Hebrew Bible. I'm going to deal with the shepherds. I will demand a reckoning of them from my flock, for my flock. And the flock will be the Jewish people. And I will dismiss them from tending the flock. Then I will appoint a single shepherd over them to tend them, my servant David. So this is when Moshe comes. He's here and God has a reckoning and dismisses the rabbis. It's not from the synagogues. It's not from their jobs. And this includes religious leaders. And leaders in general. Dismissed in the eyes of God. They're no longer in right standing with God. Which means they do not go into the scroll of remembrance of Malachi 3, which I'm getting to. Which is Entry to heaven for all those who live during the day of the Lord. It's a special heaven because it's a special time. And everybody begins sin free. But you got to get back to sin. They got to start. You don't want the evil inclination to get you after God cleans your slate and you want to show him the respect you have for his book and come back to or go to if you've never been back to Judaism back to synagogue Shabbat but there's a but there's a new covenant you say yes there is it's only an amendment the amendment is be mindful of the teachings I gave Moses at Oreb of my laws and commandments and rules for all of Israel that's the change mindful and of course, there's sin forgiveness in it, and that wasn't in the first covenant. That's what it is. Because he keeps saying, and I will be your God, and you will be my people. He says that about David, too. My servant David, he shall tend them. He did, shall be a shepherd to them, not a king. God knew Israel would be a democratic country. I, the Lord, will be their God. My servant David shall be a ruler among them. And I will grant them a covenant of friendship. So when he comes, God grants his covenant. That covenant includes, and all this starts heading towards Malachi 3, where God says he's returning to his temple suddenly, and that Elijah is to clear the way at, and be the messenger of this new covenant. I says, I will place my sanctuary among them. 
There's a lot more to this friendship coming, in, but this is the important part. My presence shall rest over them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. It sounds like at some point he stopped being your God and you were his people. He just keeps repeating it. It's just, it's just a confirmation of the first covenant with the amendment, be mindful. What being mindful is, rather than some kind of strict compliance, I think in terms of ultra-Orthodox versus Reconstructionism, you got conservatism and orthodox kind of in the middle. It's for, you know, everybody to decide. Or the righteous servant will let you know someday. The Messianic era should really be called the times of the anointed one in the awesome, fearful day of the Lord. Because that's when God says he's going to return. And Elijah's purpose is the same as the righteous servant of Isaiah 53. He's, I'm not going to go into it all. Uh, this is just an abbreviated version of a video I am putting together. I'm still trying to get all my equipment together. That will also be called Messianic Era versus the Day of the Lord. There'll be a lot more to it. But they had the same purpose. We know that the prophet like Moses is necessary. It can be any one of them as, as long as he can deliver the message. And Elijah's the messengers. They all start falling together. And what it is, is we have one description of one man. And he fulfills the final prophecy of God of four men to come. He has the capabilities and capacities of, of not only being the righteous servant who makes the many righteous, but everything Elijah would do, everything David would do, and everything the prophet like Moses would do. I mean, it's implied, it's implicit. I'm only describing one, and I'm sending four. Here he is. This is the man you look for, a man of suffering, familiar with disease. And God says in the verse of Jeremiah 38, where see a time is coming, Jerusalem shall be rebuilt. That ends with, and the Jewish people shall never be defeated and dispersed again. And Elaborating more on it again in another video, it all has to do with getting that third temple built because that's what he returns to. And he says, if Elijah's not successful, he's the one that clears the way, not David. When I do come, I'm coming with other destruction. If he comes and the temple's not here, is what he says, his last words to the prophets in Malachi 3. I can say my, my belief is he's not talking about doing it in his power. No, he's talking about his creation is going to do it. Presumably the Middle East, another great war like the Six Day War. This time, if they attack and Israel takes that mound again, I would suggest blowing up that golden dome. They don't have any problem doing it. They didn't have any problem throwing the Jews out of their countries and taking all their goods and materials and homes. They didn't have any problem getting rid of all their synagogues and tearing them down. It is time for the enemy to lead. And if Jordan does it, I would propose that a treaty be made with them of surrender or utter destruction, that they grant every Palestinian citizenship. They won't do it. They want the enemy inside Israel. I don't think God wants that. Those two books can be found at Keith McCarty, McCarty dot wordpress dot com. The script of this video is on it. If you can't understand all my words, I'm from Texas. I have a southern accent. This would be the first thing you see, then you'll see the book, uh, The Life of the Righteous Servant, and then the, the first book written, and that is Isaiah 53, The Day of the Lord.